Hello and welcome to the Telecom TV Summit on 6G Research and Innovation. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and coming up now is our discussion on channeling 6G research outcomes into commercial projects. We're going to look at how best to harness the advanced research work being undertaken by universities and research institutes around the world to ensure that there's a productive flow of innovative ideas making their way into the standards processes and then into commercial production. And joining me on the programme today are Professor Misha Dola of King's College London and David Boswathic, Director of New Technologies at Etsy. Hello both of you, very good to see you again and delighted that we're looking ahead towards the future of communications because whilst operators might not want to talk too much about 6G just yet, given the focus and the pressures of commercialising 5G, nevertheless research work is continuing. David, to what extent is the major telecoms focused research activity that's underway at universities and labs aligned with the wishes of network operators? And well, what we're seeing there are a large amount of network operators inside uh, national funded and European funded research projects. So if you look inside some of the main Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe or the UK funded research programs, you'll find many operators inside, many vendors inside and many public and private uh, research bodies inside and universities. So the community exists. Uh, what is sometimes difficult is, is breaching the gap between theory and practice, so between the cutting edge fundamental research, which it needs to happen in the research projects, and then rolling that out to the network under real service terms uh, some years later, so making it work in the network. That's, that's where the divide is, and that's where in Etsy we're trying to breach that gap. Thanks, David. We're going to certainly talk more about that um, as our discussion progresses. But, but Misha, um, first of all, you know, how much contact do you have with network operators, if indeed any contact, at an early stage when we're looking at more fundamental levels of research? So, you know, in the 6G era, actually, you know, the contact is much tighter than it was in the 5G era. I think in the 5G times, you know, the operators were quite shy in uh, talking about 5G. Uh, because what you said, you know, the, uh, the the 4G investment first needed to come through. And, you know, and some, somebody opened up the lid in, in 6G and everybody now is on it. So we are part of NGMN as an example. A lot of activities, a lot of speaking there among network operators. We have, uh, you know, private King's College uh, operator relationships. But there are also wider initiatives like 6G Futures in the United Kingdom, which has good relations with all the operators here in the UK. So I would say, you know, there's a lot of excitement uh, among the operators to really contribute and shape 6G. Well, that's good to hear. And, and you know, Misha, how much, how much is push and how much is pull? How much of this work is... is perhaps what you call greenfield research that could turn into a viable telecoms technology. And how much is it the telecoms industry passing down a wish list, if you like, of future capabilities that they'd like to achieve? I, I really don't think it's like push and pull. I, I, I think it's really push from from both ends, depending on where you stand, right? So from a research community, we're pushing through a lot of really exciting research, whether that is, you know, exploring new spectrum bands or new physical layer paradigms using AI or novel architecture. So there's a, a lot of pushing there. And the operators are pushing, of course, from the requirements, really. And um, I, I maintain, you know, both of both communities, are, you know, working towards these two big trends, which we see in telecoms. One is that really that a trend of growth and the other is the trend of consolidation so we're we're meeting somehow you know in, in, these two communities meet to really help uh, uh consolidating these these two trends if that makes sense yeah it, it does indeed and you know david do you see the same thing yourself yeah definitely i, I think it's very interesting that uh, we talked about 5G a lot later in the progress. If you look back 10 years, we weren't talking about it as fervently as we are about 6G. It seems for about a year, over a year, people have been freely happy to say, we're working on 6G, we're looking at 6G. This didn't happen 10 years ago with 5G. And now there are many international organizations, uh, regional initiatives, all looking at what 6G needs to be and what 5G evolution could be. So these are two networks that will evolve side by side for some years. So you're going to see the wonderful 5G specifications and networks being deployed and being evolved to full 5G and then onto 5G evolved. At the same time, we're going to see some fundamental technologies which will be introduced, which are really shaping the new 6G. So you will for some years have parallel streams 
5G evolved to 6G, and 6G really would be completely different or a, a different approach to, than 5G. 6G will have to do everything that 5G could not do. So I think we're definitely seeing discussions on 6G earlier, and we're seeing many more people involved in the conversation. Previ previously, it could have been just the research community saying this, this technology is fantastic, we need to work on this weakness. But now the operators, the vendors, they're all coming to the table and saying, let's say what we need to do with 6G that we can't do with 5G, that'll set us some use cases, some KPIs, some requirements, and then we'll see which technologies we need to deploy to help us get to those KPIs and those those objectives. So it's a different approach, I think, this time. It's quite refreshing. Well, it's interesting to say it's a different approach because it's certainly been um, a, a more rapid approach. There does seem to be, the timelines seem to be advanced a lot more. Maybe that's in, indicative of, uh, of just how important communications is to you know, the economy and, and society. Um, you know, given what we've we've discussed and, and the you know the increasing need to always be, be first and fast with, with viable technology, I'd like to pick up more on that the support infrastructure we've we've alluded to so far. Misha, you know, how does academia and industry stay in touch, you know, from, and stay focused and, and you know give each other mutual support? You know, that is one of the open problems and challenges. Let me call it a challenge. A very, very good question you're asking. So there's a great dynamics at the very early research type of uh, era, so the early TRLs. And then I think there's a great dynamic at the later ones uh, where standards take over and then comes deployment. But, you know, there's not so much uh, communication between, between uh, both. Uh, it is getting better. And I think we as an industry, we're doing actually quite well. But we could do better and i maintain probably to really make this grow we need incentives and uh, currently incentives have really been driving this so if you look at for instance a company is allowed to be listed on the new york stock exchange only if it has an r d department so this is always great uh, you know to force a, a telco operator to really maintain the r d department because that allows them to really speak to the vendors and to the research community which i think is really important and on the university side in the UK, we are being evaluated every five years on impact, the research impact we really make, which uh, is based on you know publications and uh, general discoveries. And um, you know I think this has really made the UK universities tick more along you know industry engagement, participation and standards, thinking about uh, you know spin out. So I think we need this at the global level and also make sure there's enough funding available to cover that gap. And this gap is, you know, as a very early innovation startup, spin out small SME gap, which requires a lot of capital. And, uh, you know, innovation grounds are available, but uh, I maintain we haven't really cracked that. And maybe speaking more to the venture capitalists, VC money, which have a really good eye for things which work and don't work, may really help to get the end-to-end -end chain really covered. Yeah, good points you made there, Michelle, and I specifically like the, the points about the, you know, getting the capital together for some of these, these spin-offs, because we know, we, we know it, it's difficult to get uh, serious investment money for, for telecom sort of infrastructure ideas. You know, applications and services is one thing, but you know, engineering, networks, infrastructures are always, always tricky. Da David, um, you know, we've, we've tried as a community to, to sort of bridge this divide with 5G very successfully. I mean, the European Union's done um, work, the EC's done work with various projects, and we've, we've had Horizon 2020, we've, we've got the 5G Infrastructure Association, for example. There's, there's work we can build on, isn't there? Yeah, there's a lot of existing work under 5G, uh, which can be improved upon and expanded upon for 6G. Um, I think it's very interesting what Misha just said, the, the fact that we need to share our information between researchers, between standards bodies and researchers, between regions, basically align the messages. So if we're all chasing, let's say 6G, let, let's see what we're chasing, maybe define it together on a global scale. Um, look at the time, like, time scales on a global scale. Are we looking for first deployments of 6G services in 2030 and 2028 and in, in, in 2032? Um, it'd be good if we could have that conversation. Obviously you have the IT, ITU, ITR discussions on, on, on 
frequency allocations over time. But very good to look at, you know, what's happening in the UK, what's happening in France, what's happening in Germany. So national research, what's happening at a U uh, European level, and then what's happening at a regional level. Can we look at the roadmaps? Can we kind of harmonize the roadmaps? Of course, there's always going to be competition between US universities in countries, between research projects, between regions. But if we can sort of optimize those resources where necessary and then compete on other levels, um, including the financing and the vision, uh, that would be very useful. So look at what we did well in 5G and then see, we have to be honest, some things could have been done better in 5G integration of research into standards and then onto products. So let's be a little bit constructive and critical and say, what could we do better this time around? And this is where we are now, looking at the 5G IA, look at the, at the new SNS uh, joint undertaking, looking at how we deal with international initiatives in America, in China, in Japan, in Korea, try and bring all that together and share. And then hopefully, I mean, talking from a standards point of view, I hope we do see in 10 years time a global standard one global standard for 6G uh, mobile communications. And that's another conversation. It certainly is. And it's a big, big, big question, this one. Uh, and we will come back to this before the show's over, promise. Uh, you, know, you mentioned the you know, competition there. And, and coupled to this, there's always been this requirement to make money from research. Obviously, you know, secure patents, create revenue that can be funneled back into funding future research, etc. Misha, from your perspective, does this sometimes lead to perhaps isolated research work and a culture of uh, maybe a culture of secrecy is pushing it a little bit? But you know, is this is this to be expected? It's the very nature of of, of competitive research, or you know, does it does it have the risk of stifling cooperation? Uh, that's a good question you're asking here. But it, you know, I, I maintain that academia is quite a few things, but it is really not a secret society. I really don't think so. It's actually part of our DNA and our charters. And in fact, of all of our funding requirements to really publish all the work, make it freely uh, you know, available, which I think is really great. And if you look now at the end-to-end -end chain, you can download papers for free. You can really upskill yourself uh, with a lot of free material, which is available you know, in the internet. And then you can actually also piggyback on open and free standards. So I think you know, there, there's no problem there. You, you know, From a money-making point of view, I think this is not really our you know, our charter. So we, we, it doesn't keep me up at night, let's say, when I have my university hat on, right? So it is more for the politicians and uh, the, the partners of the DCMS example in, in the UK, or our research council to really prove to government that for every pound they invested or for every euro dollar they invest, they will get uh, $2, et cetera, back. So, so that is, that's one side of the equation. But from the impact point of view, universities are keen to have spin outs and really also are very keen to leverage on their IPR. And I think they're not very good at this. OK, and it's something we know we're not very good at. And uh, it's just not part of our operation kind of pipeline. We're good in researching, good in publishing, good in teaching, but we're not very good in publishing or, or submitting and getting through patterns and then actually bring them to commercial success. And uh, anybody who is in the industry knows how difficult it is really to do this. So I, if we want to do that, then I think we need to improve a lot of the mechanisms and the same holds for sta uh, startups or spin outs as we call them. And universities often want to have 50% of the company, which when you bring in an external investor will question you know, who is that? Who, why, do, why is there an institution which has 50%? I can't understand that. Um, so therefore, you know, investors are getting spooked and then that also doesn't really help in, in scaling these uh, spin outs. So we're currently exploring different mo models such as the golden share, other things. Uh, we, we're in transition period. I think universities have realized there's potential to really make bigger impact than just teaching and uh, publishing papers. That's, that, that's interesting. And, you know, and David, can, can the telecoms industry and can the standards community, can, can we help? Um, definitely. I think it's very interesting uh, talking about spinning out startup companies early. That's uh, something that needs to be enabled in the UK and France so that the government can put in place, uh, make, the, make it easier to happen. So when you have a great idea, which has come from a university, can certain members of that university move on and then take that to an industrial forum or share it with industrial players that exist already? That's that's an interesting area to to study, not really from a standards perspective. What we're looking at in Etsy is, is when 
researchers and research projects should reach out to standards and when standardizers should start talking to those projects. So previously it was a bit of a divide, there was a big gap between the research world and the standards world, at least in Etsy and 3GBP, obviously IEEE, they have that covered very well. So what we're looking at doing is bringing those communities together. So when researchers are looking at doing research on, let's say, edge compute, they know they can look at standards which exist, let's say an ISG mech, use that at a base, and then when the research has progressed on three years or so of, of really innovative research, that, that information can come back into groups such as ISC, MEC, ISG, MEC, or 3GBP, and then be taken on to an industrial site. So really bringing these communities together, again, it's about education. Do all the researchers, I mean, Kings are a very good example. They know very, very much about the power of standards, but there's maybe universities who don't know why it would be important to get involved in standards, how that can bring them value to their research and to their eventual products. So that's, I think, is a lot uh, that needs to be done on the standards maker side is education and really helping researchers to find what they don't yet know they need. So really reaching out. So, so David, as you said, you know, an awareness of the standards process can benefit at, at an earlier stage in research. And you know, is this something that we, we've maybe overlooked in the past? And is this, is this something that's uh, quite new to, to, you know, your work, for instance? I think it's, as always, it's can do better. Obviously, in the past, we've reached out, we've had good interactions. I think Etsy has 120 universities, research institutes, private and public. So we're doing quite well there. But we can always do better. I mean, the research institutes don't have the same requirements from standards as a big operator, as a big vendor. They, they need other things. They have a different style of working, a different community. So a lot of our work is getting asking them, what do you need? How can we help you? And that's education on our side as well. We have for two or three years had an education about standards initiative. There's a 450 page book that can be downloaded. So that helps, but who is going to read a, read a 450 page book? So what we're also doing, we're going to universities, mainly in the UK and also in Europe and doing, um, we're doing lectures. We're saying, you know, this is, this is how standards works. This is how IPR works. This is how moving your, your research ideas into, into real products works. Let us help you. So we started, but as always, I think we can do a lot more. And Misha, do you, do you um, see the, the need for academia in general to have this, this greater awareness of what's actually going on in the standards process? I think it's really important. Uh, it is important because, you know, as academics, we're tasked to really open difficult doors, explore new territories. And uh, of course, new territories, it's an infinite area. And, and I always told uh, my colleagues and my staff in the center that we really should be geared towards answering questions which society needs and uh, and often these societal problems are you know kind of represented by industry needs because that is often also where you know the the, the business is where the, the business model works where the finances work so therefore by definition you know the standards are a great proxy to societal impact and uh, i maintain you know we shouldn't as academ academics we shouldn't go into universities, lock ourselves into our offices and then, you know, do our magic research, answer questions, which, you know, might be very important. It might be very important in 100, 200 years time. I think we should really use our intellectual firepower to make sure that we answer questions which are pertinent today, which really makes society a better place today. Absolutely. Um, absolutely agree. And, and Misha, you know, how, how much research that eventually finds its way into telecoms kit is generated from a, a handful of leading research departments or, or labs. Can we broaden this research base? Uh, you know, and, and if so, can the telecoms industry help here? I think we are quite broad already. I might be wrong. So I think we're doing pretty well. You know, can we attribute specific, you know, breakthroughs to, to specific people? Like, yes, we can. Massive MIMO, Tom Mazzaretta. But I think it would be very naive to say that it is Tom who really made, you know, 5G tick because any engineer who's really spent some time in Etsy and FreeGBP will know that, you know, you need to design a lot of things around this. You need to look at primary synchronization channels, secondary synchronization channels, uh, all the other stuff which needs to go around to really make this work so you can start using your massive MIMO array, you know, for, for with larger capacity and lower latency. So therefore, you know, from a, 
from a base point of view, more funding, of course, will always help us with uh, more breakthrough. There's no doubt about this. Uh, but we also should avoid what I call the string theory moment in engineering on telecoms that we throw everything now into one pot and then figure out that actually, you know, um, another area would have really been uh, prof uh, would have really been uh, profited from a little bit of money to 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 investigate further. I give you the example of terahertz, right? So everybody talks about terahertz. Clearly, very exciting. Uh, but we must not forget that you know there are other bands there there are other challenges in the telco ecosystem which we need to solve before any terror system comes up and running so therefore you know i think it's important the base is good uh, but we also should not forget it's like hundreds if not millions of engineering hours making sure that your 5g phone which you bought in the uk with the us sim card you know works in sydney well, as a former as a former physics student, I uh, I do appreciate the string theory um, uh, problem there and uh, danger, if you like, uh, David. You know, g given that we, we've got this base, we, we've we've got plenty of research going on around the world in in all the associated areas that that we we need to to bring together for telecoms. I mean, you've already in Etsy, you you work with a lot of companies already. Yeah, we have a large, that's the, that's the interesting part of working standards. You meet people of different backgrounds, different uh, nationalities and different histories as well. They've all got their stories to tell. Um, what I, I mean, in my, my recent job, I started working a lot more with the research community and that's fascinating. It's going back to, to what I love, which is innovative technologies and how that can be applied to future networks. Not what we're doing today, but what we may do in three years time five years time, seven years time. So that, that's really interesting. So it's a completely different community of, of people and, and, and different ways of thinking as well. But I think Misha mentioned a few very important points. We mustn't just do technology research for the sake of technology. We need to keep an eye on what the users want. If we're gonna roll out these services, uh, drones flying all over the city, uh, UAVs flying in the sky, what do the users want? What do they think? So, you know, design a great system, design a great technology, but think about the impact on users, think about the impact on humanity as well, before you start rolling out those new technologies. Is it needed now? How will it be deployed? That's very important. And also we do need to separate a little bit evolution of technology. So looking at, you know, what, what are the existing radio frequency bands we can reuse? Can we have reconfigurable radio? Can we have cellless uh, communications? All those things which are really an evolution of what we're doing. And then moving up the frequency bands. So sub terahertz, terahertz, optical wavelength, Li-Fi, all of these are very exciting technologies. But how will we fit them all together into one um, coherent network? So I think the near field uh, evolution of 5G, and then the little bit further out there, what will 6G do, which is completely innovative. They're really interesting conversations to have, but definitely bring in more people to the discussion. So a look at the regional preferences. So what is happening in Asia, in the US, in Europe, and then look at the different industrial profiles as well. So what does a smart factory need? What do we need for e-health? So doing uh, remote operations uh, over thousands of miles. What do we need for culture? Uh, what do we need for these different vertical use cases? And then bring people to the table. We don't want these vertical industries having to buy the 5G that has been designed by a load of telecoms engineers. We want them to come in and buy the 5G that has been designed for their use cases. And that will apply to 6G as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and some ex exciting times ahead. Um, now we did we did promise that we wouldn't duck this question, so we, I think we've got time for one one final question, and that's got to be around the area of of geopolitics, which has found its way back into telecoms. Unfortunately, we saw what happened with three G and how that led to fractures and and inefficiencies. You know, and this time with six G, it could potentially be a lot worse. But you know, is this all out of our hands? David, let me ask you this first. You know, is there anything that we can do at a, at a research and development level to help ensure that we make 6G a global standard? Mm, I mean, it, it's ideally it's great to stay away from geopolitics, but you can't ignore it. You, it it's, it's, it's part of the DNA of telecoms, of human nature, in fact. Uh, when you look at the funding coming into Europe, into the UK, into the US, they all have some geopolitics behind them. Um, what it's best to do is, Focus on the user needs, focus on the technology needs, share the roadmaps, share as much information as possible, and then compete on certain areas. But what I really would hope we would see in 10 years time is a single global standard for uh, 
6G mobile new, uh, communication networks. If we see multiple fragmented mobile standards, the world is going to be a very confusing place. And when you come to uh, travel from Australia to London to uh, China, it's going to be very, very complicated again. And we managed to get rid of that some 20 years ago. So let's be reasonable, focus on the user needs, the technology and how this can help humanity as, as a whole, not just uh, individual regions. I hope people will be reasonable. Absolutely. I think, I think we, we absolutely all do. And Misha, some final thoughts on yourself on how we can, at this early stage, as we're just looking at research into, into 6G, how can, is there anything we can do to, to help ensure that we do have a, a harmonised global standard? Yeah, we need to communicate. I completely agree with David on that. So keep the doors open, uh, be very inclusive. And I, I can confirm that, you know, standards bodies like Etsy through GBPR, I participate in a lot of Etsy standards meetings and everybody's welcome. Every opinion is welcome. Consensus is being reached. And I think that's really great to see that at industry level and at academic level, you know, we are one big family. Uh, you know, when I look at the editors in chief, uh, you know, my colleagues writing books, uh, we are uh, peer reviewing our articles. So I don't think there's any uh, politics being played out. And I think that's great. And I think we should leave it exactly like that. Excellent. Well, on that positive note, I think we'll draw our discussion to a close. Thank you both very much for participating and sharing your views. Good to hear from the both of you. Now, if you're watching this on day two of our Telecom TV Summit on 6G Research and Innovation, then don't forget, send us any questions you have on this subject and we'll try and answer them in our live after show programme later today. And please do take part in our online poll. You'll find it below this video player window next to the Q&A app. All of this week's programmes are available to view online here at Telecom TV. We'll be back later for the after show. Until then, thanks for watching and goodbye.